Uh, welcome, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, but that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You'll see I've got no pictures today, really because <laughs> the whole of chapter 10 is people just being hacked to pieces. and um, um, We can either imagine it or act it out, <laughs> if, if you like. Um, anyway, uh, I know I labour this point of going through the kings to set the story so far, but it is quite important today to just revise... Um, first you had Saul as king of all Israel, then um, of course David becomes king of Judah while Ishbosheth is king of Israel, then Ishbosheth is murdered and David becomes king of the whole shebang. He is succeeded by his son Solomon, Jedidiah. But after Solomon, his son Rehoboam is so arrogant that the kingdom split, splits in two and you have Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who becomes the king of Israel. And Jeroboam, son of Nebat, um, he, has, uh, he is succeeded by his son, Nadab. And, but Nadab uh, is assassinated by Baasha. Baasha, uh, his son Elah, takes over him from him, but not for long. Uh, he's assassinated by Zimri. And Zimri is assassinated by Omri. And this is the point where we've got to because you have this dynasty, Omri, and then his son Ahab, and then his son Ahaziah, and his brother then takes over from him, Jehoram, and Jehoram is assassinated by Jehu. And that's where we've got to. Jehu, who is very zealous, who is chosen by the Lord because Elisha himself sends an acolyte prophet to anoint him. But some of the commentators say, why does Elisha not anoint him himself? Is it simply fear? We notice that whereas um, even Ahab and Elisha um, and uh, uh, certainly Ahaziah and Elisha are seen together, um, Elisha never interacts with Jehu and uh, in the Bible often you find those kind of subtle signs that show us that maybe, you know, when people say, why does God want all this violence? Just maybe he doesn't. I'd like to think, and I'm right uh, <laughs> on that one. Um, so we're going to hear more about Jehu's violence. So far, you might argue that it's somewhat justifiable. Um, you know, nobody likes Jezebel. Um, the king of Israel certainly was um, uh, a badon, uh, and so his um, assassination by uh, Jehu is justifiable. Not sure about how right he was to assassinate the king of Judah as well. He wasn't really mixed up in that at all. But let's see what happens next. And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. Now, 70 is clearly a nice round number. And um, probably they're not all his sons, although they could be if he had lots of wives. Um, but more likely it's his sons and his sons' sons. And, and it's also a kind of um, nice kind of symbolic number. We met... Um, before the 70 sons of, Gib uh, of Gideon, um, and so it's a, a kind of echo of that. And Jehu sent letters and sent them to the rulers of Samaria, to the elders of the town, and to Ahab's tutors. So he sends out these letters, and he's very devious and very sly and cunning and nasty. He sends these letters not to the 70 sons, but to the kind of officials 
uh, who uh, are scattered around the country, and the tutors presumably being their kind of advisors or teachers of the, of the children. And the, the letter said, And now, when the, this letter comes to you, and the sons of your master are with you, and the chariots and the horses are with you, and the fortified towns and the weapons, you shall see to the best and the most fitting of your master's sons, and put him on his father's throne, and battle for your master's house. So Jehu says, OK, I've killed the king. Maybe you'd like to choose one of his sons to be a successor. And um, come and take the throne if you like. It's not a very inviting offer, is it, given what we already know of Jehu? And they were very, very afraid. And they thought, look, two kings could not stand up against him, and how can we stand? So there is, he's just killed two kings, and now he's saying, send another one and I'll deal with him. Um, and they think, you know, we're on the wrong side. What are we going to do about this? And Jehu's used this technique before when Jezebel was standing at the window. He says, who wants to be on my side? And the eunuchs came and pushed her out. Uh, so they saw uh, what the upshot was going to be. And he who was appointed over the palace and he who was appointed over the town and the elders and the tutors sent to Jehu saying, we are your servants, and all that you say to us, we shall do. We shall make no one king. Do what is good in your eyes. So very um, uh, prudently, they write back and say, make another king? Of course not. We can't think of anything nicer than having you as our king. Um, please you know, tell us to do whatever you like. <laughs> And he wrote them a letter. This is where it gets really nasty. He wrote them a letter saying, If you are mine, and heed my voice, take off the heads of the men who are your master's sons and bring them to me at this time tomorrow in Jezreel. So remember, he's not in Samaria, the capital. Um, he's in Jezreel. That's where Jezebel was and where she was defenestrated. So he says, right, you've kind of, you've fallen into my trap. So if you are on my side, it won't be any trouble with it to bring um, the heads of all the sons of Ahab uh, to me this time tomorrow in Jezreel. And the king's sons, 70 men, when, uh, were with the town's notables who had reared them. That's a lovely poignant detail, isn't it? You know, the people who brought them up were suddenly told... Okay, chop the heads off and bring them to Jezreel. And it happened when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slaughtered the 70 men and put their heads in baskets and sent them to him in Jezreel. That's nice, isn't it? You know, uh, big job for the Royal Mail that week. And the messenger came and told him, saying, they have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said... Put them in two piles at the entrance of the gate until morning. I think this is why you're probably quite glad we don't have any pictures this week. Um, the pile of 70 severed heads. Imagine that by Booth and Bar. Um, of course, we know that um, at Micklegate Bar, they did used to put the heads of traitors on spikes. Um, but uh, that hasn't happened for a little while yet. So... That to lay out uh, the heads that are outside the gate. And it happened in the morning that he came out and stood and said to all the people, Well, you are innocent. Look, I plotted against my master and killed him. But who struck down all these? Know that nothing will fail of the word of the Lord that he spoke against the house of Ahab, but the Lord has done what he spoke through his servant, Elijah. So Jehu comes out and he says, all right, anyone want to condemn me for having killed two kings? Because this is what you, the people, have done. 
70. So in other words, he makes all the nation accomplices in his revolution. And from now on, they've got no moral ground, ground to stand up to him on. And also, he raises himself up on a moral ground. He says, this is exactly what Elijah said would happen. Well, it is. That was what was prophesied, of course, in Naboth's vineyard. And so not only has um, uh, Ahab's son, have Ahab's sons been killed, uh, now all the sons of the sons, the whole of the family has been wiped out. And Jehu struck down all who were left of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his notables and his intimates and his priests till he left him with no remnant. And remember what Elijah had said to Ahab, I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. So because Jeroboam was unfaithful, all his house was wiped out. And now because Ahab and his sons were unfaithful, nobody is left of the house of Ahab. And he rose and went and came to Samaria. So he now goes to take possession of the capital city of Samaria. When he was at Beth Eked Haram on the way, Jehu encountered the kinsman of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and he said, Who are you? Now remember, Ahaziah, he's also killed, and Ahaziah has been taken back to uh, Jerusalem and given a burial, uh, unlike the king of Israel. Um, but these relations we assume, have not heard this, because otherwise they'd hardly be um, you know, ambling along through the roads of Israel uh, and happy to meet <coughs> Jehu. Who are you? And they said, we are the kinsmen of Ahaziah, and we are going down to see if all is well with the king's sons and the sons of the queen mother. Oh dear. Uh, so they said, oh, we just come to see if everything's all right with the family. Because remember, Israel and Judah have got uh, royal houses, had a family relationship because Atalia, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, had married the king of Judah. And so they're all the family are from Judah and they're on a kind of, you know, royal jolly. And they say, we're just coming to see the queen mother and, you know, um, uh, is she well? Well, we know she's been thrown out a window. She's not at all well. Oh, dear. And he said, seize them alive. And they seized them alive, and they slaughtered them at the pit of Beth Eked, 42 men, and he did not leave a man of them. I told you it was going to be uh, quite bloodthirsty tonight, didn't I? It's not over yet. Don't relax. And he went from there and encountered Jehonadab, son of Rechab, coming for toward him. And he greeted him and said to him, is your heart steadfast with me as my heart is with yours? And he said to him, it certainly is. Give me your hand. And he gave him his hand and he took him up to him in the chariot. Well, given that we know how Jehu drives, um, this Jehonadab must indeed be a great supporter of Jehu if he's willing to get into the chariot with him. And a little aside now. Jehonadab, we haven't met him before, but we hear that he is the son of Rechab. And um, we encounter him, in fact, um, uh, later on, as being uh, somebody who is particularly zealous um, and um, who represents fidelity to God. So remember, Jehu is judged in an ambiguous way by the scriptures because on the one hand he is going to cleanse the worship of the nation he's going to um, destroy the temple of baal on the other hand his violence well we'll come to that what the scripture says about it uh, and also we'll see other reasons why um, sacred authors disapprove of him however um, it is interesting uh, about jehonadab because um, Jehonadab talks about zeal for the Lord. And he is a Kenite. What is a Kenite? The Kenites were not originally part of Israel. But 
go way back. Moses, when he came to Midian, when he had fled from Egypt, who did he meet? He met the daughters of Jethro, priest of Midian. And Jethro, uh, who becomes Moses' father-in-law, because he's the father of Zipporah, whom Moses marries, Jethro has loads of different names, um, seven different names, in fact, in the Torah. And one of those names is Hobab. And we are told in Judges 1.16 that Hobab is a Kenite. And if I can find where I have marked it, I think it's in this Bible, Judges 1.16. Um, we read there that... Well, I thought I'd marked it, but anyway, just find it very quickly. Uh, and the descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of the Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad. And they went and settled with the people. So if you remember Jethro, although he seems to be originally a priest a Midianite priest, so a, a, a false god, he attaches himself to the people of Israel. In fact, he comes along to Moses when Moses is judging all the people in the wilderness and taking all day listening to all their court cases. And it's Jethro who says, this is madness. What you want to do is you want to have a system of lower judges and intermediate judges and higher judges and then you. And that way, you won't be exhausted by all this. And Moses takes his advice. So Jethro, um, when he sees what happens at the Exodus, he says, now I know that the God of Israel is, is the true God. And of course, Zipporah, his daughter, um, uh, she also, uh, she is the one who circumcises her sons and who um, uh, becomes such a support to Moses. So Jethro is a Kenite, and we also read about another Kenite, Heba the Kenite. You might say, who he? Uh, who he? You have. The answer is, again, he's mostly important for his wife. His wife's name is Jael. And Jael is pretty zealous for the Lord, because when Sisera, the enemy commander, comes and takes refuge in her tent in the middle of the night, having given him uh, a nice uh, skin of hot milk. While he's snoozing, she takes a tent peg and she hammers it through the side of his head. So Jael is pretty zealous and, and, um, and that's a, a big moment of victory uh, for, uh, for the Israelites. So it would seem that the Kenites gradually get incorporated into uh, the people of Israel, but still have some kind of separate identity. Um, we're told Rechab is the father of Jehonadab. Jehon um, earlier on, when uh, Saul meets the Kenites, this one I think I have marked, 1 Samuel chapter 15, um, verse 6, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 6. Um, Saul came in the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So whereas other people uh, attacked the Israelites when they were thirsty in the desert, the Kenites showed kindness to them. And all those years later, Saul uh, remembers this and says, get out the way, I'm going to you know, slaughter all these Amalekites and I don't want you caught up in it. And exactly the same happens later on in the first book of Samuel, um, when David uh, has defeated the Amalekites in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 29, um, just bring my eyes into focus to read this small writing. Um, uh, 
it, yes, all I can see is in the cities of the Kenites, what he does is he allows them to share in the spoil. Now, keep, keep remembering uh, the Kenites because, this is the last thing I'm going to tell you about them, um, they continue to be mentioned in the Bible many, many years later. Um, and uh, that is, if I can just find the reference, That is just think among yourselves for a moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the well, here we go. Yes, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter thirty-five, verse six to ten, and that is marked. Jeremiah, so he is writing or preaching and it's written down and it's prophesying at the time when Judah is going to go into exile. So this is hundreds of years later um, and he's telling them the reason you're going to go into exile is because you have been unfaithful whereas um, I took Jehanaziah the son of Jeremiah son of Habaziniah and his brother and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites so they're descended from Jonadab's father, Rechab. I brought the, them to the house of the Lord into the chamber of the house, sons of Hanan, the um, son of Igdalia, man of God, which was near the chamber of the princes, above the chamber of Massesia, the son of Shalom, keeper of the threshold. Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, drink wine. But they answered, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, you shall not drink wine, neither you nor your sons forever. You shall not build a house. You shall not sow seed. You shall not plant or have a vineyard, but you shall live in tents all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us, to drink no wine all our days, ourselves, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, and not to build house to dwell in. We have no vineyards, or field, or seed, but we have lived in tents, and have obeyed and done all that Jonadab our father commanded us. So Jeremiah says, well, therefore, when Nebuchadnezzar comes, you're going to be fine, because you are faithful to your covenant. Um, they're kind of um, very strict and they won't even live in cities. They're still uh, nomadic like um, the Israelites had been originally. Um, and rather like John the Baptist, or I was told, you know, drink no uh, wine or strong spirits from his youth. Um, the Rechabites are faithful. So while all the rest is going to be swept away, Jeremiah says to them, you're going to be all right. And all of that stems from Jonadab, who meets Jehu, all these hundreds of years before in the second book of Kings, which we'll get back to now, having made that little detour through the history of the Kenites. So he gets into his chariot, scary. And they came to, he came to Samaria and struck down all who were left of Ahab in Samaria till he destroyed them, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. So it seems Jehu who keeps on finding more people to slaughter and stamp out and get rid of. And now he's going to play another trick. And Jehu gathered all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little. Jehu will serve him abundantly. And now call to me all the prophets of Baal all his servants and all his priests. Let no one be missing, for I am about to have a great sacrifice to Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. So he says, let's have a really big, you know, kind of uh, even song in praise of Baal. <laughs> and let's gather them all together. But she who dealt deviously in order to destroy the servants of Baal. It's a trick. Okay. And she who said, call a solemn assembly to Baal. And they came. 
and Jehu sent out through all Israel, and all the servants of Baal came, and not a man remained who did not come. And they came to the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was filled from corner to corner. A little bit reminiscent of when Samson brought down the temple of Dagon in among the Philistines, and it was absolutely packed. Uh, and so this is going to be another occasion when, yes, God's glory is shown, um, though perhaps um, not quite uh, in the way that, that it should be. But remember what I said last week, that Jehu is in some ways, shockingly, the template for our Lord himself. He is acclaimed king by having garments laid under him, just as our Lord was on Palm Sunday. And then the Lord goes into the temple and cleanses it. And this is what Jehu does um, on this occasion. And he said to the one appointed over the wardrobe, bring out garments for all servants of Baal. So Jehu um, goes and talks to the sacristan uh, and he says, bring out the best vestments. So they're all going to get dressed up uh, and have a wonderful time. And he brought out garments for them. And he came into the house of Baal and Jehonadab, son of Rechab, with him. And he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search and see if there are here with you any servants of the Lord beside the servants of Baal alone. And they came to perform sacrifices and burnt offerings. And Jehu had set for himself 80 men outside. And he said, any man who escapes of the men whom I have brought into your hands, his life for that man's life. So these 80 men surround the temple. Remember how when Elijah was told um, to anoint Hazel as uh, the king of Aram, Jehu as the king of Israel, and Elisha as prophet in his stead, and we're told whoever escapes from Hazel's hand, he'll be killed by Jehu, and whoever escapes from Jehu will be killed by Elisha. And so you do see that the Lord's punishment has kind of been set up in this way. Hazel is the one who injured the king of Israel, which is why Ahaziah, king of Judah, went down to visit him, and then they're both killed. And now all these followers of Baal are going to be killed by the 80 men stationed outside the temple. And it happened when he finished performing the burnt offering that Jehu said to the sentries and to the captains, Come, strike them down. Let no man get away. And they struck them down by the sword, and the sentries and the captains flung them out, and they went to the town of the house of Baal. And they brought out the sacred pillars of the house of Baal and burned them. And they smashed the sacred pillar of Baal. And they smashed the house of Baal and turned it into latrines to this very day. And Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. And so far, on that score, that's a tick for Jehu. That's a plus point. Does he end up as a good king, however? But Jehu did not swerve from the offences of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had led Israel to offend the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. So remember back when Israel split from Judah, Jeroboam didn't want them going up to the festivals in Jerusalem, and so he created an alternative calendar so that they'd miss the Passover anyway. And he also made golden calves one in Dan and one in Bethel, so that they could go and uh, there instead of the temple in Jerusalem. And it would seem that although Jehu destroys Baal, he doesn't get rid of these high places. That doesn't make him absolutely an idolater, because I think that we can say that the people at Dan and Bethel are still in fact worshipping uh, the God of Israel, but they're not worshipping him in the right way, in the way that he's commanded, in that one place where he sets his name in Jerusalem, in the temple. And the Lord said to Jehu, Inasmuch as you have done well what is right in my eyes, according to all that was in my heart, you have done to the house of Ahab, four generations of your sons 
shall sit on the throne of Israel. So, in fact, Jehu's dynasty is, I think, the longest lasting in the house of Israel. Uh, whereas in Judah, you've got the Davidic line right down till they're all sent into exile um, in Babylon. Um, that happens, the Assyrians come in Israel much earlier than that. But Jehu, um, he is succeeded by his son, Jehoahaz, who's succeeded by his son, Joash, who's succeeded by his son, Jeroboam II, who's succeeded by his son, Zechariah. And only then does the house of Jehu get wiped out. So although he's pretty nasty um, and not somebody to encounter on a dark night, especially if he's in a car, um, <laughs> nevertheless, strangely, Jehu is he's the best of all the kings of Israel. All the others are marked as evil, and he at least is mixed. <laughs> so, and that's uh, you know the, the best you could hope for, it seems. Um, but Jehu did not watch out to go by the teaching of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. He did not swerve from the offences of Jeroboam, who had led Israel to offend. In those days, the Lord began to trim away Israel, and Hazel struck them down through all the borderland of Israel, from the Jordan, where the sun rises, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites from Aroa, which is by the wadi of Arnon and Gilead and Bashan. An image, you know, bits being cut off, trimmed away. And why does the Lord do this? It's not just out of anger, but actually to call them to repentance. Don't you see that, yes, I promised you this land, and I said, if you are faithful, you'll keep it. If you're not, you don't. And so there's a gradual encroachment, a gradual chipping away until it's all gone. And notice who goes first, the Gilead. The Gilead is on the other side of the Jordan. And back when they were entering to cross the Jordan, um, the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, who had settled in the Gilead and said it's marvellous pasture land for our our flocks and Joshua said to them yes but you promised that you would help us to conquer the promised land proper and so you come with us and then you can go back again and so they do but you notice in the book of Joshua there's a kind of greed in the way that they speak they mention their flocks and their herds first before their wives and their children and every little nuance in the Torah is always significant um, and so um, we can see that there's a kind of hardening of their hearts even at that point and although later on they set up a kind of um, symbolic altar on the far side of the Jordan to remind themselves that they're part of the Israelites on the other side of the Jordan nevertheless perhaps it's not surprising they're the first to go later on other tribes will disappear but they are the first because they never fully give themselves to God and to what you might call the project of, of um, uh, the settlement of the promised land. And the rest of the acts of Jehu and all that he did and all his valour, are they not written in the book of the Acts of the Kings of Israel? And Jehu lay with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. And Jehoahaz, his son, became king in his stead. And the time Jehu had been king over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. So there are lots of other things that happen, and the scriptures are only interested in the things which have a spiritual and religious significance. And he does have a very respectable reign. And we're back to the kind of alternating between Israel and Judah, and a little summary of each king, and then you go over to the king on the... Uh, other side of the border as we will do next time except it's going to be a queen and I'm afraid a rather wicked one um, but what is the final judgment of the bible on Jehu you get it in the book of the prophet Hosea again writing some centuries later um, right at the beginning 
chapter 1, verse 4. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel for yet a little while. This is um, Hosea, who's, uh, you know, all prophets have a difficult time. And he's told to marry a wife. And right from the beginning, he knows that she will be unfaithful to him. And it's a prophetic act because his marriage is going to symbolise, it's going to be a kind of parable of Israel's unfaithfulness to her Lord. And so he marries, they have um, sons, and um, this first one, um, the Lord says to him, call his name Jezreel. And we remember what happened in Jezreel, it's where Jehu carried out his butchery where he killed the sons of Ahab, piled up their heads at the gates of the city, where he threw Jezebel out of the window. Call his name Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So the Lord says in prophecy through Hosea, um, I'm going to punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. And so we see that Jehu's zeal is misplaced. His zeal begins perhaps with a desire to magnify the Lord, but in the end it's just a bloodbath that doesn't have an ultimate religious reason um, because he doesn't wholeheartedly follow the Lord. And what's the message? Unless we give everything to God, unless we actually let him into all the dark corners of our lives, then even the good we seek to do will be corrupted and will, um, will be for our own glory uh, and won't actually um, make a right relationship with God for us. And on that sober note, I will stop. Um, Next time, as I say, we're going to hear about Atalia, who is the queen mother now in Judah. And remember, she's the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. So unlikely uh, that she's going to be a, a kind of um, cuddly uh, heroine, isn't it? Um, but we will have to have a little break before we hear about her, because this is the last time that we are meeting before Easter. And we will meet again i worked out i think we can get seven sessions in in the sort of summer um so we'll meet again obviously not on easter monday um but the following week which is the 8th of april all being well we will assemble again and hear um more gory details uh, from the second book of kings mm. i pray thee loving jesus that as thou hast graciously given me to drink in with delight the words of thy knowledge, so thou wouldst mercifully grant me to attain one day to thee the fountain of all wisdom, and to appear for ever before thy face. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.